the Great Fire of London, a devastating incident that transformed the city's topography, ignited on September the 2nd, 1666, and persisting for four grueling days, until it was finally extinguished on September the 6th. The conflagration originated in a bakery on Pudding Lane, adjacent to London Bridge, and rapidly disseminated, exacerbated by vigorous winds, and the city's largely timber structures. Notwithstanding the devastation of more than 13,000 homes, 87 parish churches, St. Paul's Cathedral, and the majority of municipal edifices, it astonishingly yielded a minimal number of fatalities, at least those documented. But the consequences of the fire resulted in a substantial urban transformation in London. King Charles II designated commissioners to revamp the city, resulting in the establishment of new construction regulations and the adoption of brick and stone in place of timber. The reconstruction period resulted in the establishment of the contemporary London Street Plan and the architectural contributions of prominent figures, such as Christopher Wren, who oversaw the renovation of St. Paul's Cathedral and various other churches. Thus, the Great Fire of London is a crucial event in the history of the city, showing again urban fragility but also resilience, and significantly impacting urban planning and fire safety legislation from those days on. Welcome to the channel, everybody. For those new, good to meet you, and those coming back, good to have you again. We have a rather hot one today. It's a hot topic, I suppose you could say. Now, all jokes aside... I do appreciate those who like, subscribe, and leave a nice little comment. And not just me, the algorithm also appreciates it too. So, if you want others to share in the joy of this wonderful community we've created, well, just click a few buttons and you're contributing more than you would imagine. Now, with that all being said, it's time for us to begin. And, of course, we begin all the way back in the 1660s, where London was quite a different place. But it had one thing in common with the modern-day London, that being that it was Britain's largest city. Well, how large was that? Well, it had a population ranging from 300 to 400,000 at the top end of it, and that ranks it as the third largest in the Western world. Of course, you have Paris, too, and the other one escapes me. But still pretty big. So, in 1659, there was one John Evelyn who described London as a wooden, northern, and inartificial congestion of houses. Somewhat of a foreshadowing. Of course, this is a star contrast to the orderly Baroque grandeur of Paris. Now, by inartificial, Evelyn essentially meant that the city had grown organically, without much planning or even any regulations. You'd find a place to build your house, and, well, you'd simply build your house, sometimes on top of somebody else's house. Well, in layman's terms, it was a bit of a mess. It was essentially turning into this chaotic urban sprawl. Originally, London was actually a Roman settlement. It goes back that far. And it even had the old city walls. And within these walls was where most people wanted to build their houses. You must remember, 1659 was still sort of on the tail end of siege warfare. Still being inside the wall gives you this kind of sense of safety. Now it also spread beyond the walls too, into these external districts like Cripplegate, Clerkenwall, Southwark, 
shore ditch and the inns of court, stretching westward along the strand to Westminster's royal palace and abbey. So, by the late seventeenth century, this grand old city of London, defined by the area enclosed by the city wall and the river Thames, represented just a fraction of London's overall size. Remember, we make this distinction between the urban populations and metropolitan populations. Now, the area had covered about 700 acres, and roughly had about 80,000 residents. This is within inside the actual city walls, which accounts for about a quarter of the total population. The city was surrounded by a ring of inner suburbs where most Londoners lived. But the city itself remained the commercial heart, housing England's largest market, and along with that, of course, England's busiest port, dominating trade and industry. However, that comes with problems. It was also extremely congested, even more dirty, and hand in hand with congestion and filth goes unhealth. You can see we're maybe having some problems here. Of course, this was especially following the outbreak of the bubonic plague in 1655, which devastated the population. You probably heard of the Great Plague of London. Well, I did do a video on it a while back if you're interested in that. But for now, we'll only talk about it in context to the Great Fire. Of course, it wasn't always happy times in London apart from the filth and the congestion and the dying of horrible diseases, there was also the tensions between the city and the crown, and they were as common as the filth. Perhaps they go hand in hand too, not to get political. Well, of course, London had been a stronghold of Republican sentiment during the English Civil War, and that's in living memory since that lasted 1642 to 51, in those chaotic days of Charles I, who they actually beheaded. Not the usual end for a king, especially in those days. Certainly put the rest of the aristocracy on high alert. Now, the city's wealth and power allowed it to challenge the authority of Charles II, as shown by multiple Republican uprisings in the early 1660s. The city magistrates, whom many of them had lived through the Civil War, were determined to avoid another attempt at absolute monarchy, which they believed had caused all the turmoil under Charles I. So when the Great Fire threatened the city, they simply refused Charles II's offers of help, including all of his soldiers and all of his resources, as they were weary of bringing these royal forces into the city. By the time Charles took charge from the ineffective Lord Mayor, the fire was already completely out of control. Now, it didn't help as well that the city of London at this time had what was essentially a medieval street layout. We're talking a dense, narrow network of these winding, dirty cobblestone alleys. Before the Great Fire of 1666, London had already experienced a few other large fires, with the most recent occurring in 1633. Despite long-standing laws banning the use of wooden structures and thatched roofs, these cheaper materials, well, they were all most people could afford. And thus they remained common. Well, what were they going to do, start tearing down people's homes? But think about it. A wooden structure with a thatched roof, it pretty much is in a great resemblance to a matchstick line enough of them up, and you have a big problem waiting to happen. Of course, not all of London was poor, you had the wealthier parts of the city, where merchants and 
Brokers lived in large homes, but these were the only areas that were predominantly built with brick or stone, because they were the only ones who could afford it. Surrounding this affluent centre were overcrowded and poor parishes, where every available space was used to accommodate the rapidly growing population, which seemed to never stop growing. Of course, the houses in these areas were tightly packed and built in ways that increased the risk of fire. The typical multi-story houses had these jetties, as they were called, upper floors that extended over the street. No doubt if you've seen depictions of those medieval houses, you know what I'm talking about. Although these homes had small ground-level footprints, the overhanging upper stories created dangerous conditions that nearly touched over the narrow streets, making fires more likely and harder to contain. You see, if you have this street that's wide enough, especially a cobblestone one, it acts as a kind of fire break. Of course, well, when the street is narrow enough for fire to leap over, that doesn't really do much for you. And when the second level, or the third level, is closer and almost touching the building across the street, well, yeah, it's very easy for the fire to cross over. Now, in 1661, Charles II tried to address this by banning overhanging windows and jetties, but it was pretty much ignored. In 1665, he issued another warning about the fire risks posed by narrow streets, and he gave permission to arrest builders who violated the fire codes, or simply to just remove dangerous structures. Do you think anyone listened to him? Of course they didn't. This too had very little impact, if any impact at all. And by anyone's estimation, no one really cared about what the king had to say about it, especially when the poor were just trying to get by in whatever house they could. The situation was already miserable enough as it was. No one was going to allow someone to come rip their home down, regardless of how Comely it was. Of course, the river front as well played another role in both the spread of the fire and the attempts to fight it. You see, the Thames offered a source of water and an escape route by boat. But the densely populated riverside areas were filled with warehouses and cellars, and of course, they were storing highly flammable materials which increased the danger even more. And along the wharves, rickety timber tenements and tar paper shacks were crowded among the aging buildings, storing substances like pitch, rosin, tar and hemp, and piles upon piles of flax. Large amounts of gunpowder were also stockpiled in the city, particularly along the river, where ship chandlers kept barrels of powder for trade. Much of it was left over from the English Civil War, with between about 500 and 600 tons stored in the Tower of London alone. Then, of course, there's the imposing Roman wall around the city, which, in contrast to keeping people safe, actually obstructed escape from the fire, limiting people to eight narrow entrances. Of course, then you've got the problems with overcrowding and stampedes, people being trampled to death. Not a good situation. Now, in the initial days, few of anybody contemplated evacuating the engulfed city entirely. They would transport their possessions to a more secure location, or others just relocated their goods and themselves four or five times during a single day. The realization of the necessity to escape the confines emerged only late on Monday, resulting in near panic at the gates and distressed refugees attempting to flee with their belongings, carts, horses and wagons. 
The primary obstacle hindering the early firefighting efforts was the constricted width of the streets. Of course, nothing was built to code. Now, in typical conditions, the combination of carts, wagons, and pedestrians in narrow passageways frequently resulted in gridlock and accidents. Refugees fleeing from the epicenter of devastation were obstructed by soldiers attempting to maintain clear roadways for firefighters, which of course exacerbated the fear even more. Now, fires were prevalent in the densely populated wooden city, characterized by fireplaces and candle ovens and warehouses full of flammable materials. Now, there was 1,000 watchmen, also called bellmen, that patrolled the streets at night, monitoring for fires as part of their responsibilities, and this had been set up for quite some time. There were also autonomous community protocols established for fire management, and generally they were effective. There were these publicly spirited citizens, who would be notified of a perilous house fire by muted tolls of the church bells, and would swiftly assemble to combat the blaze. Volunteers. Now that goes back a long time. Now firefighting during the Great Fire of London relied heavily on demolition and the use of water. Each parish church was required to keep firefighting tools such as long ladders, leather buckets, axes, and fire hooks for tearing down buildings. Now, in some cases, controlled explosives were used to demolish structures quickly and create fire breaks. These drastic measures were crucial in stopping the fire, and along with the wind eventually dying down, played a key role in controlling the blaze. Well, didn't control it completely, but... They did their best. Of course, the usual method of containing fires was to demolish buildings that were downwind, either with the fire hooks or the explosives. However, the Great Fire was a little different. This approach was delayed for hours due to the Lord Mayor's failure to act promptly. Yes, the blame is pretty much on him. Now, efforts to extinguish the fire with water were also hindered. You see, water was supplied through a network of elm pipes, serving around 30,000 homes from a high tower in Cornhill, refilled by the river at high tide, and by a reservoir in Islington. Firefighters could often tap into these pipes near a fire to fill buckets or hoses. You see, the fire had started close to the river, where, ideally, in the best of situations, firefighters should have formed lines to carry buckets of water from the Thames to the fire. But guess what? It didn't happen, because everybody was too busy panicking and fleeing. Of course, the flames eventually reached the riverbank, damaging water wheels beneath London Bridge, and completely cutting off the water supply. Though London had some advanced firefighting technology, at least for the time, we're talking like fire engines, things like this, there weren't really much use during the Great Fire. You see, the engines, large pumps designed to deliver water to the fire, were mostly mounted on sleds without wheels, and that made them difficult to move quickly. There were a few engines that were wheeled, but many of them just arrived too late. Or they couldn't get close enough to the fire due to the intense heat. Firefighters tried to fill the engine's tanks by bringing them to the river, but several of them actually fell into the Thames, and, well, others just couldn't get close enough to make a difference. So, that's the gear that they had, the situation they're dealing with, but let's rewind it back a little bit, just so we can get a bit more of a story. Now, it all started at the bakery in Pudding Lane, 
more specifically, Thomas Farinow's bakery, just after midnight on Sunday, September the 2nd. Now, the family of the Farinows was confined upstairs, but they successfully went down from an upper window to the adjacent house, with the exception of a maidservant, who was reportedly too terrified to attempt to escape. And so, just like that, the Great Fire of London took its first victim, the poor frightened maid, screaming and burning. Rest in peace to her. Now the neighbours, of course, they had a rude awakening. They attempted to extinguish the fire, which was brave. After an hour, however, the parish constables arrived and deemed that the adjacent houses should be removed to avoid further spread. Of course, the residents were not pleased at this news, prompting the summons of Lord Mayor Sir Thomas Bloodworth for his authorization. Well, eventually Bloodworth did arrive, and by the time he did, the flames were engulfing the neighbouring houses and advanced upwards towards the warehouses and combustible materials along the river. The more seasoned firefighters said that demolition was really the only way. However, Bloodworth, in all his expert opinion on firefighting, tended to disagree, citing the difficulty in locating the owners of the predominantly rental properties. Of course, Bloodworth, I'm sure you'll find, is the villain of the story. He's widely regarded as having been appointed to the position of Lord Mayor because of his compliance, rather than his qualifications for the role. And you're about to find out how qualified he really is. Well, he experienced stress during an unexpected emergency, and when confronted, uttered the frequently cited phrase that a woman might urinate the fire out. And then he just left. Well, on to a more well-known name. We have Samuel Pepys. And so, Samuel Pepys entered the Tower of London on Sunday morning to observe the fire from the battlements, which would have been the best view in town of the worst day in town. Now, he documented in his diary that the eastern gale, as in the gale force winds, had transformed what was a small blaze into an outright conflagration. It had incinerated around 300 residences and extended to the riverside. The residences on London Bridge were even ablaze. That's right, they used to have houses all over London Bridge, shops, all the rest. Pretty common. Now, he boarded a vessel to closely examine the devastation surrounding Pudding Lane, and characterized the fire as lamentable, noting that everyone was striving to salvage their possessions, either casting them into the river or transferring them to lighters anchored nearby. The unfortunate individuals remained in their homes until the flames encroached upon them, subsequently fleeing to boats or scrambling from one set of stairs by the water's edge to another. Peeps proceeded westward along the river to the court at Whitehall, where many gathered around him, and he provided them with an account that frightened everybody there. And thus the information was quickly conveyed to the king. He informed the king and duke about his observations, and stated that unless the king ordered the immediate demolition of the buildings, then the fire could simply not be contained. Of course, they appeared a little bit distressed about this, but the king instructed him to convey to the Lord Mayor his command to demolish all the structures in the path of the fire, and that was without exception. Now the fire rapidly propagated in the strong winds, and by mid-morning on Sunday, individuals ceased efforts to extinguish their homes and began to evacuate. 
and the throng of people, along with their bundles and carts, rendered the pathways inaccessible to firefighters and carriages. Peeps himself utilized a coach to return to the city from Whitehall, but disembarked at St. Paul's Cathedral, necessitating a walk thereafter. Pedestrians burdened with hand carts and merchandise were still evacuating from the fire. They entrusted their treasures to parish churches, distant from the immediate risk. By Sunday afternoon, the fire had escalated into a ferocious conflagration that generated its own meteorological conditions. A significant upward movement of heated air above the flames was propelled by the chimney effect in areas where the air current was confined, such as the narrow space between the jettied buildings, resulting in a vacuum at ground level. The resultant intense inward breezes exacerbated the flames. Think about it like bellows in a fire. And then the fire advanced towards the city centre in a wide, arciformed trajectory. And by the evening it had become the most destructive fire to impact London in living memory, having advanced 500 metres west along the Thames River. Well, by Monday it was much better. The fire propagated to the west and the north. The advance to the south was largely impeded by the river, however. It had incinerated the residences of London Bridge, and posed a threat of crossing the bridge to jeopardise the borough of Southwark on the southern bank of the river. London Bridge, that sole physical link between the city and the southern bank of the river Thames, was identified as a perilous site during the fire of 1633. But nothing was done. Seems to be the prevailing theme, doesn't it? Nevertheless, Southwark was safeguarded by an open area between structures on the bridge that functioned as a firebreak. Lucky for them. Well, what about the northern spread? Well, that touched the financial core of the city, the central business district, if you will. The residence of bankers on Lombard Street ignited on Monday afternoon, inciting a frantic effort to salvage their piles of gold coins before they liquefied. Ah, oh, well, if anyone's going to lose their houses, I suppose the bankers can lose it. We're not a fan of bankers on this channel. Now, numerous observers highlight the despair and helplessness that appeared to engulf Londoners on this second day, alongside the absence of initiatives to protect the affluent, fashionable areas which were now threatened by the flames, including even the Royal Exchange, both a stock exchange and shopping hub, and the luxurious retail establishments in Cheapside. The Royal Exchange ignited in the late afternoon and became a smoking shell within a few hours. Now we have an account from John Evelyn, who was a diarist and courtier, and he wrote, and I quote from his words, the conflagration was so universal, and the people so astonished, that from the beginning I know not by what despondency or fate they hardly stirred to quench it, so that there was nothing heard or seen but crying out and lamentation, running about like distracted creatures without at all attempting to save even their goods. Such a strange consternation there was upon them. Evelyn resided at Deptford, four miles from the city, and so did not see the initial phase of the catastrophe. Now on Monday he travelled by coach to Southwark, accompanied by 
numerous other members of the upper class, to observe the view of the blazing city across the river that Samuel Pepys had witnessed in the previous day. Now the inferno had significantly intensified, and he said, The entire city was engulfed in terrifying flames near the waterfront, all the structures from the bridge throughout Thames Street, and extending towards Cheapside, down to the three cranes were now obliterated. In the evening, Evelyn observed that the river was congested with barges and boats, laden with merchandise attempting to flee. He witnessed a significant evacuation of carts and pedestrians through the constricted city gates, heading towards the vast fields to the north and east, which for many miles were scattered with various belongings and tents erected to shelter both individuals and any goods they could salvage. A wretched, disastrous scene. Suspicion quickly emerged in the endangered city that the fire was actually intentional. I wonder who they're going to blame that on. Well, the tumultuous winds transported embers and ignited particles over considerable distances, embedding them in thatched roofs and wooden gutters, which resulted in seemingly disconnected house fires erupting far from their origin. Well, that, of course, fueled speculation that new fires were being deliberately lit. Well, of course, the first go-to for blaming is the foreigners. They were promptly regarded with suspicion. Due to the ongoing Anglo-Dutch war, and so on Monday, fear and suspicion solidified into conviction as tales emerged of an impending invasion and sightings of foreign covert operatives allegedly launching fireballs into residences or apprehended with hand grenades or matches. Of course, this prompted a surge of urban violence. Of course, the apprehensions regarding terrorism were exacerbated by the breakdown of communications and the dissemination of news. The General Letter Office on Threadneedle Street, a postal hub for the entire nation, was consumed by fire early on Monday morning. Well, there goes the media. What are we going to do without them? Well, the London Gazette successfully published its Monday issue prior to the printing facility catching fire. All that paper would have went pretty quickly, I'm sure. Well, on Monday, suspicions escalated into panic and the communal hysteria, prompting the trained bands and the cold stream guards to prioritize the apprehension of foreigners and individuals deemed suspect over firefighting, resulting in area, in arrests rather, and interventions to protect them from mobs. Now the residents, particularly the elites and upper class, were increasingly anxious to evacuate their possessions from the city. This generated revenue for these able-bodied impoverished, who engaged as porters, sometimes just absconding with the merchandise themselves, proving particularly lucrative for the proprietors of carts and boats. Make hay while the sun shines, I suppose. Well, renting a cart had cost about a few pounds a week prior to the fire. But on Monday, that price had gone all the way up to 40 pounds. It doesn't sound like too much. But that is a sum equivalent to about £130,000 in 2021. And you're probably talking about the same in US dollars. I think the conversion is around the same. Now, almost every single cart and boat owner in the vicinity of London participated in this, with carts colliding at small gates as the frantic residents attempted to escape. 
The tumult at the gates prompted the magistrates to temporarily close them. Aiming to redirect the citizens' focus from protecting their belongings to actually helping to combat the blaze. That, with no exception, of salvaging any items, they might fervently strive to save their homes. Now, Monday signified the commencement of coordinated efforts. Despite the disintegration of order in the streets, particularly at the entrances as the fires uncontrollably blazed. Bloodworth, the unpopular Lord Mayor, was tasked with supervising the firefighting efforts. However, no one could find where he was. He had seemingly vacated the city as his name is absent from any contemporary chronicles of the events on Monday. During the state of emergency, the king appointed his brother, James the Duke of York, to oversee activities. James established command posts throughout the fire's perimeter. Three courtiers were appointed to oversee each position, with direct authorization from Charles to mandate demolitions. James and his bodyguards patrolled the streets throughout Monday, rescuing foreigners from the mob and striving to maintain order. Well, on Monday evening, expectations were thwarted as the substantial stone walls of Baynard's castle in Blackfriars failed to contain the flames. Serving as the western equivalent of the Tower of London, this historic royal residence was entirely engulfed and raged in flame throughout the night. Tuesday, the 4th of September, was the peak of the devastation. Not a nice thing to wake up to at all. The Duke of York's command post at Temple Bar, where Strand intersects Fleet Street, was intended to halt the fire's progression westward towards the Palace of Whitehall. He anticipated that the river fleet would create a natural fire break, positioning his firefighters from Fleet Bridge to the Thames. On Tuesday morning, the plan did not go as they wanted. The flames surged over the fleet and encircled them, propelled by the relentless easterly gale, compelling them all to flee. By mid-morning, the fire had penetrated the expansive, opulent shopping avenue of Cheapside. James's crew established an extensive fire break to the north of the blaze, however it was compromised at several locations. Throughout the day, the flames advanced eastward from the vicinity of Pudding Lane, directly opposing the prevailing east wind, and heading towards the Tower of London. And, if you remember... That was full of 500 to 600 tons of gunpowder. You can see how this is going to be a problem. Now, the garrison in the tower acted independently after awaiting assistance from James's official firefighters, who were occupied in the west throughout the day, and they established their own fire breaks by detonating houses extensively in the surrounding area and lucky for them, the fire was stopped before it got to the tower. Well, all believed that St. Paul's Cathedral was a secure sanctuary. Of course it was. Robust stone walls, a large vacant plaza encircling at a natural fire break, now the space was densely filled with salvaged items, and its crypt contained the tightly packed inventories of the printers and bookshelves from the adjacent Paternoster Row. The structure was enveloped in wooden scaffolding, undergoing incremental restoration by Christopher Wren. The scaffolding ignited on Tuesday evening, and within thirty minutes the lead ceiling had began to melt 
and eventually the books and papers in the vault ignited. The cathedral rapidly deteriorated into a smoldering ruin. On Tuesday evening, a somewhat of a reprieve, the wind subsided, and the firebreaks established by the garrison commenced to show some efficacy on Wednesday, the 5th of September. Peeps ascended to the steeple of Barking Church, from whence he beheld the ravaged city, and I quote, the most lamentable spectacle of desolation that I have ever witnessed. Numerous isolated fires continued to blaze, although the great fire had essentially concluded it required considerable effort to extinguish the final remnants, and coal continued to smolder in cellars more than two months later. Only a limited number of fatalities were recorded, and it is conventionally assumed that the casualties were minimal. Porter cites the amount as eight, while Tinniswood states in single figures, noting that some fatalities may have gone undetected. Additionally, he mentions that refugees also succumbed in the makeshift camps, apart from direct deaths caused by fire and smoke inhalation, which is, by the way, how most people die in fires, asphyxiation. Now you think about it, all that smoke. It's only so long that you can breathe that in without passing out. And usually the smoke gets you before the fire does. Maybe that's a better way to go. Now, the material devastation has been quantified at 13,500 residences. 87 parish churches, 44 company halls, the Royal Exchange, the Customs House, St. Paul's Cathedral, Bridewell Palace and other city prisons, the General Letter Office, and three western city gates, Ludgate, Newgate, and Aldersgate. In terms of financial loss, we're talking between 9 to 10 million pounds, which in today's money is about 2.1 billion. So, what happened next? Of course, they didn't just abandon London. That would be silly. Reconstruction efforts, and radical ones at that, were submitted for the devastated city, and endorsed by Charles. In addition to Wren and Evelyn, it is acknowledged that Robert Hooke, Valentine Knight, and Richard Newcourt offered proposals for reconstruction. Now all of them were founded on a grid pattern, which became widespread in the American metropolitan environment. Now if it had been reconstructed according to certain ideas, London may have competed with Paris in Baroque splendor. Now archaeologist John Schofield asserts that Wren's scheme would have likely facilitated the segregation of social classes into distinct areas, akin to Hausmann's reconstruction of Paris in the mid-1800s. But if you ask me, that's a bit of a misnomer. A social class is not already segregated. The rich people live in the rich area, the poor people in the poor area. Well, either way, Wren's concept was especially difficult to execute, due to the necessity of redefining property titles. Too much paperwork, and no one likes paperwork. So the Crown and municipal authorities endeavoured to negotiate compensation for the extensive remodelling necessitated by these plans. But that impractical notion had to be relinquished calls to recruit labourers and assess the land where the houses once stood, were largely disregarded by individuals preoccupied 
just with daily survival. As well, of course, by those who had departed the capital. Additionally, there was a labour shortage resulting from the fire, which rendered it unfeasible to obtain workers for the arduous task. The majority of the original street layout was replicated in the new city, at least for the most part. Now, it's been suggested that this procedure expedited the advancement of scientific survey and cartographic methodology, methodology rather, basically encompassing the creation of these ethnographical city maps. The renovation resulted in enhancements in cleanliness, of course, and fire safety. We're talking broader streets, open and accessible wharfs along the Thames, free from blocking dwellings and, crucially, most important, structures that were built of brick and stone rather than wood. So, this all got put into a new law called the Reconstruction of London Act, 1666, and it prohibited the use of wood for building exteriors, limited the prices of construction materials and labour, and established, established a three-year reconstruction period after which the land might be sold. A tax was also levied on coal to finance the municipal reconstruction expenses. The majority of private reconstruction was finalised by 1671. New public edifices were constructed on the grounds of their predecessors, including St Paul's Cathedral and Christopher Wren's 51 new churches. So, the Great Fire not only altered the city's physical landscape, but its demographic, political, social, and economic. Well, the fire resulted in the most significant disruption in London's residential architecture in its history. It wouldn't be surpassed until the blitz of the Second World War. The regions of West London experienced the greatest influx of new people, where there was an overall rise in population density in the suburbs encircling London. Approximately 9,000 new residences were constructed in a region where over 13,000 had been obliterated, and by 1674, thousands of them were uninhabited. Tenants that remained in London experienced a substantial reduction in their lease expenses. But of course, it also impeded commercial operations resulting in destruction of buildings and inventory, while the victims incurred substantial debts and reconstruction expenses. Consequently, the economic recovery was sluggish. The City of London Corporation incurred substantial debts to finance its reconstruction, defaulting on its loans in 1683. Thus, it had its privileges revoked by Charles. The commercial district of London had substantial vacancies as merchants relocated to other areas. Charitable foundations incurred substantial financial losses too, due to direct fire-related expenses and the forfeiture of rental income. Either way, notwithstanding these circumstances, London maintained its economic preeminence due to its access to maritime routes and ongoing centrality in England's political and cultural spheres. Undefeated. Well, there will be plenty more bad luck for London in the future. Now, if you go to London today, you can go to where the fire started. At the request of Charles II, a monument to the Great Fire of London was erected right at the spot on Pudding Lane, designed by no less than Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke themselves. It's 61 metres tall, 
That's about 200 feet, so you can't miss it. In 1681, an inscription, inclu which included the accusation towards the Catholics of causing the fire, was added. But that was removed in 1830, following a campaign led by city solicitor Charles Pearson after the Roman Catholic Relief Act of 1829. Another monument, the Golden Boy of Pie Corner and Smithfield, marks where the fire is said to have ended. Well, thank you very much for listening. I'm sure you enjoyed that one. Oh, London has some bad luck, doesn't it? Hopefully we don't have any more things like that happen in the future. Well, I'd like to thank my top-tier patrons as Dark, Carey, Kimberly, Ember, Ben, Britt, Charles, Aaron, James, Jeffrey, Melissa, Scott, Stark Factory, Wendy, Jaden, Sherry, Jessica, Christine, Sally, Katiana, Christine, Fzabo, Legitmus, Maverick, and Susan. Thank you all very, very much for joining me once again. And, you know, I'll be right back here tomorrow. I'm always here, on YouTube, just making the videos. And if you've made it this far, why not click the subscribe button? Leave a like or a little comment telling me if you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much. Let's all get a good rest tonight. Good night, lots of love to you all.